Our scripture reading this afternoon is once again in John, the gospel according to John chapter 21, and we will pick up where we left off this morning, verse 15. So we'll read 15 through 25 of John 21. Let's hear the word of God. So when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, Feed my lambs. He says to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He says unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He says to him, Feed my sheep. He says unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved. Because he said to him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said to him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said unto him, feed my sheep. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou goodest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldst. But, When thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldst not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, Follow me. Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Jesus saith to him, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Then went the saying abroad among the brethren that that disciple should not die. Yet Jesus said not unto him, he shall not die, but if I will that he tarry till I come. What's that to thee? This is the disciple which testifieth of these things and wrote these things. And we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. Let's sing the congregation as we pick up, as it were, where we left off this morning, considering the second half of this chapter in connection to the first, as we move, as it were, from come and dine to follow Jesus. Where he says, come and dine. Now he says this afternoon, follow me. Called to follow Jesus. We want to look specifically at verse 19. The second part of that first, John 21, verse 19b. And when he, that is Jesus, had spoken this, he, that is Jesus, says to him, that is to Peter, follow me. But that word, not come, doesn't only come to Peter, it comes to all of us. This is the word of God speaking to us today. That's something we should remember when we read the Bible. 
I have to remind myself of that many times that I, that I pray before I read and say, Lord, help me to believe that thou art really speaking to me right now. It's not just words printed on a page. It's God who speaks. So we want to consider that call to follow Jesus, a renewed commitment, a complete commitment, and a personal commitment. First then, a renewed commitment. We read when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, follow me. So when he had spoken this, that comes right on the heels of this conversation that Jesus had with Peter. When they were dining, as I said this morning, it seemed that there was not much, if any, conversation at all. Remember I said they were speechless. They were, nobody dared to ask, who art thou? They just sat there. Silent fellowship with Jesus. But then the Lord Jesus speaks specifically to Peter. In verse 15. Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? It doesn't just say, do you love me? But do you love me more than the other ones? You wonder if it already began to dawn on Peter at that time. Maybe he was thinking back, if all these would forsake thee, I would not. I will die for thee. Maybe it didn't dawn on him the first time. But when Jesus repeated the question, second and third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He says to him, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He says to him, feed my lambs. Three times. This afternoon, I do not want to focus on the differences in these three times, but more on what binds it together. Not how they are different, but on how they are alike. You see, the purpose of the Lord Jesus was to restore Peter. To renew his calling, to renew his commitment. It was a very gracious way of doing it by asking this question three times. Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And he surely did. He had testified of his faith and love for the Lord Jesus many times. Many times since he was called to follow the Lord Jesus for the first time. You remember when, in Matthew 4, you can read about that, when Jesus called him the first time to follow him. When he called Peter and his brother Andrew away from the fishing nets. Follow me. That was the first time in Matthew 4. And I will make you fishers of men. And that's what Peter began to do. Hmm. By the grace of God. but with many shortcomings, with great failures. When when the Lord Jesus asked the same question for the third time, you you could see that things began to fall into place in his mind because you read that Peter was grieved. Verse 17, when Jesus said to the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved. Because he said to him, the third time, lovest thou me? And he said to him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. He was grieved. Pained. Saddened in the depths of his soul. That third time. When he said, Lord, thou knowest all things. Things began to click in his mind. 
Why does Jesus do it three times? I denied him three times. That's why. But it was at the same time comforting, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. Jesus did not reject him. The congregation, I have to ask you a question. Do you, and I ask myself that question, do I love the Lord Jesus? Whether or not you attended the Lord's Supper, what has the commitment in your life? I'm not just talking about feelings here. Love is more than feelings. When a couple gets married in the beginning, there's a lot of feelings. But what carries through is the commitment of the vows. The commitment to each other's well-being. Peter said, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Maybe you have also thought, as I did, when I read this, thought many times, I wish I had denied the Lord Jesus only three times. I wish that would be that law of a number in my life. Instead of, look at Peter, three times denied. Hand on my mouth. How many times have I denied him? Maybe not vocally and publicly, but quietly. Not only by what I said, but what I did not say. Missed opportunities to witness of the Lord Jesus. But the question is now, if you are convicted about that, does it grieve you? Are you sorry for that? Are you sad about it? Is it your sorrow? Have you wept bitterly as Peter did when he denied the Lord Jesus for the third time and then their eyes met and Jesus and Peter looked at each other? He went out, wept bitterly. How many times have you Broken your vow to commit yourself to Jesus. Here we have a beautiful example how the Lord will come back to you to have a renewed commitment. That's why the word is preached. That's why the Lord's Supper is administered. So we would come with all our failures once again and be cleansed and have a renewed commitment even though the feelings are not always there. But the desire for it is. You see, I've often wrestled with that. To what extent do I have love for Jesus? And Afton was confused by that, limiting that to the feelings. But I increasingly see not only that love is a commitment to serve and to seek the glory of God and the well-being of those around us, but also that I read once 2 Corinthians 5 verse 14 where I was greatly comforted when it says, for the love of Christ constrains us. Do you hear the difference? Not the love for Christ, but the love of Christ compels us to recommit time and again. The love of Christ makes me more and more committed to do what's pleasing to him. For the love of Christ constraineth us. So really, it's not about our love for him, but his love for us, what he did for us. Oh, his total and complete commitment to us. 
1 John 4, 19, we love him because he first loved us. So Jesus says to us, as he did to Peter, follow me. Follow me. No, not to be an apostle or a preacher, but just be a Christian following the Lord Jesus. When you confess this morning to profess his love, you profess his love by partaking of the Lord's Supper. Do you also practice it? This morning was come and dine. Be strengthened, be nourished. Now follow me, Jesus says. Whithersoever he goeth. When Peter said, thou knowest all things, it was not just about his past failures, but perhaps even her, his fear about future failures. Lord, I've failed so many times, I'm afraid that I'm going to stumble again. Jesus says, I know. I know. I've so foreseen all that in the stillness of the never begun eternity. You see, Peter knew that he could not do it better in the future, in his own strength. All things are known by God. Also that we do not have the ability to follow up on our promises, but he does. He will sustain us. The love of Christ for us constrains us. So that's the first thing, a renewed commitment. But second, there is also a complete commitment. Not only do we recommit ourselves to him again and again every Lord's Day, every time we open the Bible, every time we pray, every time we, we are re-energized or refocused. But it's also complete. Jesus says, follow me. Now, children, young people, what does it mean, older ones, what does it mean to follow Jesus? Well, what does it mean to follow anyone? If you follow someone, you walk behind that person. If you go for a walk with your parents, you, your parents say, just follow me. When you go over a trail together, you walk behind that person. Now, oh, well, to follow Jesus is that, but there's much more to us. It's not only to go where he goes and walk where he walks, but to do as he did, to begin to do as he did. It's not only to be justified, but also to be sanctified and ultimately be glorified. To follow Jesus is to imitate him. Imitate is to, to act, to speak like the one you follow. As, we as parents like to have our children follow us as we follow the Lord, but we do not want them to imitate what we did wrong. But Jesus is a perfect one, perfect Savior, perfect Lord, and perfect example. Looking to Jesus will always be the right thing to do. We cannot say, I cannot say, to my children or grandchildren that looking to me will always be the right thing to follow. I've disappointed them many, many a time. Broken promises. Not done as I said. Not practiced what I professed. But Jesus is a perfect example, perfect leader. So what is it then? To follow Jesus. As I mentioned already, it's to love God and our neighbor. That's the perfect example. That's the perfect way of keeping the law, to love an, our God above all things and our neighbor as ourselves. 
1 Corinthians 13 makes it very plain. We can have all kinds of gifts, all kinds of abilities. Maybe a respectable, a very respectable moral life. Maybe sound in doctrine. Give my goods to the poor, die as a martyr. Even have all faith, it says. So that I could remove mountains but have not charity, I am nothing. I have nothing. I am nothing. Without charity, with charity is really love. The word charitable, like a charitable donation or charitable organization, really is the word charitable means love in action. I regret that the word disappeared from the common English language. Because the word charity is actually more than just love. It's love in action. So love is the supreme mark of a true follower of Jesus Christ. Jesus said in John 13, verse 35, By this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you have love one to another. All men can know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Because you can say, I love God, but if you don't love your neighbor, you're a liar. So the love that we have for, for the Lord manifests itself in the way that we love one another. Because that's what people can see. That's what they can observe in your life. We can easily talk about much in religion, even say we love God. Maybe have certain feelings or affections, or treasure certain experiences. But if it doesn't result in following Jesus in the way he loved his father and loved his neighbor, we have words and no actions. Following Christ is, someone said, being as useful to others as Christ is to us. J.C. Ryle said, a vast amount of Christianity is perfectly useless in the sight of God. And he goes on a little further. Churchgoers who are content to attend services and hear sermons, and I would add, attend the Lord's Supper, but know nothing of fervent love to Christ's person and never lay themselves out to imitate him are in the broad way that leads to destruction. When I read that, I was very convicted. That's why I'm so grateful that the ultimate yardstick is not my love for him, but his love for me. That will carry me through. And that also inspires love in return as a commitment. Not only renewed commitment, but the desire for complete commitment. Throughout my entire life. So in other words, we <coughs> we're called to imitate Christ, to follow him. And we realize that that's a tall order. To believe in the Lord Jesus, to trust him, to confess our sins, that's one thing. But to follow the Lord Jesus and indeed follow him fully. Well, humanly speaking, that is impossible, indeed. Impossible with man, but possible with God. Peter couldn't do it either. Of course, he thought he could. For a long time, he thought he was doing pretty good. He thought he was making some good progress, and he spoke many times before he was thinking. He acted many times before he was thinking. He thought he could do it. When In John 13, he said, in verse 37, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. That's what he said. I will lay down my life for thy sake. And then he denied the Lord Jesus three times. Not counting or considering any other sins that he committed in the meantime. That was before he denied the Lord Jesus. He had such great self-confidence. 
But now he's beginning to learn the lesson. And when you read his epistles, you see how much he learned indeed, especially, of course, after Pentecost, during Pentecost and after Pentecost. He realized that without Jesus, they can do nothing. So he wouldn't die for Jesus, but Jesus would die for him. And it took a while for him to get that processed in his mind. Jesus would give himself for Peter. Jesus would die for him. He had to learn this necessary, painful lesson time and again. And so do we. And it doesn't feel good when we're convicted. But it is good. It would be worse if you would not be convicted. If you think you're doing pretty good, then you're in the same track as Peter, or maybe as Judas, who followed Jesus too for three years. But he did not repent when he betrayed Jesus. Peter wept bitterly. So when we're convicted, it doesn't feel good. Just like pain. Nobody likes pain. But we know when we have pain, we know there's something wrong. So we go to the doctor or to a dentist. So when our conscience pricks and hurts, it doesn't feel good, but it is good. Because it, if it leads us indeed to repentance, to confession of sin and to put our trust in the Lord Jesus for the first time or afresh. To follow Jesus is to humble ourselves, to deny ourselves. Luke 9.23 says, and he said to them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So if you want to follow the Lord Jesus, this is going to come denying of self. And isn't that true in marriage? In families? To care for the other person more than for yourself? To seek the well-being of the other person more than yourself? They're so selfish by nature. It's so hard to, to be humbled. It's so hard to deny ourselves. But we can do it looking to Jesus. See what he did. What he went through. How he denied himself. Humbling himself even to the death of the cross. So to be a believer means we must count the cost. See, to become a believer costs us nothing. But to live as a believer costs us everything. Somebody once says, grace is free, but it's not cheap. Not only because of the price that is paid by Jesus, but also for the cost to ourselves. Self-denying, humbling ourselves. You see, as Jesus showed complete commitment, so must we. And we can do that only looking to Jesus, trusting in Jesus, leaning on Jesus. Reflecting on Jesus. Getting to know him better. Grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Peter ends his second letter. That's the way. Not only the way to God, but the way following Jesus as well. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's not just an entrance. It's a lifelong path and a way of living. So Jesus knows we cannot and by nature will not do these things. I've learned that increasingly too. I read it in the Bible. It's not, our root problem is not the cannot. Our root problem is will not. 
I observed it many times and, and in my own family, and I see it around when parents try to give the children what they need and how resistant they are. You don't have to teach them to be resistant. It's not that they cannot obey you or that they cannot eat what's in front of them. They will not. That's our root problem. When Jesus wept over Jerusalem, he would have gathered her as a hen or chickens, but he said, you would not. That's why we need the Lord Jesus, to make us willing in the day of his power, willing and able. Jesus knew that Peter couldn't do it. That's why earlier he told Peter that he would pray for him. When Peter was so boasting and self Self-sufficient in his own eyes, Jesus said that he prayed. I said, well, pray for you that your faith fail not. I've prayed for you that your faith fail not. Jesus is making intercession for us. He's not only that all power has give, been given to him, ruling all things, but he's also interceding for us. Do you, do you think about that? Even when you and I are sleeping, he is making intercession without ceasing. Praying for us, even when we do not think about him. That's why we need to be reminded of that time and time again. You think about that sometimes? Reflect about that the Lord Jesus is praying for you. Right now. Right now. Right now. Right now. Constantly. How we can imagine that, I do not know. But he knows every single one of us. Not just by name. But he knows everything about us. He knew everything about us. And yet he set his love upon us. Ought this not give you more zeal and energy to follow him? Completely? With a complete commitment? That's also why now we read in verse 18, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou goodest thyself. You did it yourself. And walkest with it, thou wouldst. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and an other shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldst not. When you were young, you thought you could do it all. But when you're older, you'll realize more and more how much help you need. And it will be there. I will be there for you. Carry thee whither thou wouldst not. It didn't say couldst not. Same thing. When he was young, he thought he could die for the Lord Jesus. But when he became older, he realized that without the Lord Jesus, without Jesus, Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. But also with Paul, I can do all things. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Every time the way back is through Christ, to Christ, through Christ, by Christ, for Christ. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Without coming unto me, you can do nothing. But through Christ, you can do all things. Complete Commitment And Peter, indeed, lived a life like that. Very clear, because the Lord Jesus says this he spoke, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith to him, follow me. So Jesus very clearly states that Peter's life and death would signify the complete commitment. He did not die without he, he did not commit any more of those denials 
that he had done before. We do not know the details, but he died a martyr. Most agree. His death, his life would glorify God in a way that is kind of put together in, in a few words in Psalm 116, verse 15. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Precious death. Precious death of Christ means costly. But precious in the, in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints, those that have come through life and were kept till the very end. My dear friend, is that your life? Is that your commitment? I'm not asking how successful you are. Because then we all fail. But I'm asking, is this your desire? Do you want this? A renewed commitment time and again. And a complete commitment to follow Jesus. Remember what I said this morning? If this is your desire, if you pray for these things, God is more ready and willing to give all that you need than we are to ask for it. We have all the treasures, all the power we need. But we fail so often because we don't, we don't seek it. We don't use these means. We don't seek to see, to receive Jesus. But we're called to follow Jesus. So we have a renewed commitment, complete commitment, and it's only because of grace, but also a personal commitment. That's very important too. A personal commitment. I don't know if you noticed that, but in verse 12, we read that Jesus said to them, to the disciples, come and dine. In verse 19, we read that to him, Jesus said to him, verse 19, follow me. You see, for a moment as a church, as believers, we had this privilege to be together here and, and to sit around that table and be re-energized together as a group, as a church. Tomorrow, we're going to go back, and perhaps many of us work in a very lonely place, just by yourself. Without these others around you to be encouraged by, as I prayed also earlier this afternoon, that we go back into a world of darkness and temptations and trials, often facing them when we're alone. By ourselves. And sometimes it can even be in the company of others. You're still all by yourself. We're privileged to have fellowship with the Lord Jesus and with each other. But tomorrow we may be in a lonely trench in the battlefield. It can be overwhelming. And it must have been for Peter and for the other disciples many times. We know that many of them died as martyrs. They gave their lives, ultimately, in following Jesus, humbling themselves. So Jesus calls Peter to follow me, a very personal calling. Because ultimately, we, as couples, we may be very close, but each one of us, As parents, as children, church members, ultimately we all stand before God alone. By ourselves. We had a queen in the Netherlands, Queen Wilhelmina. I think it's the great grandmother of the current uh, Prince William, who wrote a book. She was a true believer, a Christian. And that book title, you can look it up. It's in English too. The title is Lonely, But Not Alone. As a queen, 
She was responsible for a lot of decisions. It was a lonely post. Even her husband, who was indeed her husband, but she was the queen. Her husband was prince. So the buck, as it were, stopped with her. Lonely post, but not alone. She knew that the Lord Jesus was with her. I remember reading that, and I thought that's, that's a beautiful expression. Lonely, but not alone. Remember that. Even when you're all by yourself, you're not alone. Jesus says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. My Holy Spirit shall not be only with you, but in you. God's fatherly providence is leading every step along the way. But this call to follow Jesus is not just for believers only. It's for unbelievers too. Just like as this call this morning to come and dine came to all. It's a command. This do in remembrance of me. This command comes to all. Follow me. It's not just a general command, but a very personal command. As I said this morning, as soon as we have the word of God in our possession, there's no excuse for not being saved. There's nothing lacking in Christ. Again, I must say, ye would not, what Jesus said. It's not about cannot. That's a simple gospel. A glorious gospel. Acts 17, verse 30, we read that, and then that's past Pentecost, right? That God now commands all men everywhere to repent. So who's excluded? He commands all men everywhere to repent. If you haven't done that, what excuse would you bring forth? For God not only commands repentance, but he grants it. He not only commands faith, but he gives it. It's a gift, which he is more ready to give than we are to receive. Reflect upon that. All men, everywhere, Jew, Gentiles, twice the Lord spoke to us today. Very personal matter, very personal way. Come and dine. Follow me. It's uh, very clear that Peter did follow the Lord Jesus. We read in Acts and his epistles and whatever we know about his life. It's very plain, very clear. He followed the Lord Jesus immediately, as he did the first time when he was called from his fishing net. But then, as he follows Jesus, he's being distracted. Verse 20. Then Peter, turning about, sees the disciple whom Jesus loved following, John. And verse 21, Jesus we read, Peter, seeing him, that is John, says to Jesus, Lord, and, and what shall this man do? No. I'm not sure what the motives were of Peter when he looked around and as if his, his good friend John, his fellow disciple, Lord, what about him? Maybe it was true care. Will he follow thee too? Maybe it was just curiosity. I don't know. Maybe there's genuine care. Lord, what shall this man do? Lord, yes, that's about me, but what about him? What will happen to John? And Jesus answers very swift and very pointed, isn't it? He says, if I will that he tarry till I come, what's that to thee? Follow thou me. So now we get from the follow me to the specific personal focus here. Follow thou me. What's that to you that what I will do with him? That's his business. Follow thou me. You follow me, Peter. Whatever other people do or don't do. Now, that doesn't mean, of course, that we shouldn't care for other people. We should. Because that's part of loving one another. As Jesus loved us, 
So we cannot say, I'll be careless about what happens. No, you, you should care. But it shouldn't distract us from following the Lord Jesus ourselves. So from verse 19, follow me, to verse 22, follow thou me. Do you see that the, the net, as it were, narrows? He spoke first to them, then to Peter personally, and then he emphasizes, you follow me. So that, that's not look at other people right now, what they will do and what they won't do. Yourself, myself, each one of us. Follow thou me, the Lord says. And that following the Lord Jesus means, of course, to love one another and to love God. It's part of it. It's so prone, isn't it, to look at what other people do or say or don't do or don't say, particularly when it's about us, or compare and judge. While we only see the outward appearance, we don't know the inward heart, we don't know the motives, we don't know really what's going on, we only see a glimpse of the other person. God sees at the heart. He knows everything. Not just of them, but of us, of me, of you. Regardless of what other people do or don't do. Jesus says to us today, what's that to you? You follow me. Jesus will take care of others as he will take care of you. And he will use you to take care of others as well. But how can you lead others in the, in the way if you get distracted yourself? They fall into the ditch. Jesus made it very plain. Follow thou me. So often our eyes are in the wrong place. We look at ourselves for strength for encouragement, for compliments, self-exaltation. Self is still our biggest enemy, dear congregation. Self-seeking, self-promoting, self-pleasing. That's exactly opposite of what Jesus did. Jesus was other-promoting. Jesus was restoring what we were in paradise, created to please and to serve God, to be other-directed. That's what in Jesus is being restored in principle, so that we would now follow him. And no matter what comes against us, even if we really hate it and for, and and. and Despised by people. Jesus went through it before us. Whenever we've experienced any opposition or any difficulty. I was talking about that with somebody yesterday. About when we reflect upon our trials and our difficulties. One thing is, one way is to think about what we deserve. We deserve worse. But another and better thing is to think about what Jesus went through. All our suffering, all our disappointments will mean nothing in comparison to what Jesus went through for us. Let's not be distracted. Let's focus. Somebody said, following Jesus is like plowing a field. And got that from Luke 9.62. Jesus said to this man, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. If you're a farmer, you know a little bit about what plowing means. If you look back, you get off track. You've got to fix your eye on a certain spot and stay there. If you want to have a straight plowing line in the field. You don't look back. You look forward. You look to the Lord Jesus Christ. Have your eyes fixed on the Lord Jesus. Trust in him. Lean on him, on his spirit. Because his spirit dwells in you. Even though so often it doesn't feel like it. It feels sometimes like the opposite. 
Because the Spirit convicts us so that we would continually go back to the Lord Jesus Christ. Lose all our self-confidence. Casting upon our, ourselves upon the mercy of God. Paul summarizes it in this way, and I conclude with that. In Philippians 3, 13 and 14. It's not just Peter, but Paul here. Brethren, he says, I count not myself to have apprehended in other words, I have not arrived. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth into those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let's so carry on thinking about this, realizing I have not arrived, but I shall one day. And I press on for that day. That one day, as I said this morning too, we will be perfect. We may do what we want and sin not. Is that something you long for? If that's something you would desire to happen at the end of your life, then begin today. Because how we live will determine also how we die. Let's reflect upon that. Let's pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for Thy Word, which is brutally honest with us, which exposes every excuse, every escape, every sin, every shortcoming. And it can be painful and humbling or humiliating at times. At the same time, Lord, it is worth it if it brings us again and again back to the Lord Jesus, to see Him, to receive Him, to follow Him, to trust him, to press on, as the Apostle Paul said, toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Amen.